Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Making Changes to Your Learning Site webinar for the National Education Nature Park. Um, I'm Dr Jade Gunnell, and I'm the Community Science Officer at the Natural History Museum. And I'm joined by uh, Mary Jackson uh, from Learning Through Landscapes and Simon Calderley, who's a regional coordinator based at the Royal Horticultural Society. And first, we're just going to give a brief introduction to what the Nature Park is and why is it that the, the Department for Education have decided to fund such a programme. Um, so we know collectively as a society now that nature is really struggling in England, We're one of the most nature deprived countries in the whole world. Um, and uh, human health is also struggling. We're aware of increases in anxiety and um, physical health problems in society. And we know that there's a link between our engagement and connection with nature and some of these issues. But we're also very aware that we need to equip young people um, with the skills and knowledge about nature and kind of science, technology, engineering and math skills so that for our future economy, we have the workforce and um, engaged citizens that can make sustainable and environmental choices about the future um, of society. Next, next slide, please. And so the overall aim of the programme is to empower every young person in England to take action to make positive difference both for themselves as well as for nature's future. Um, and so what we're doing is we're trying to help young people with this by helping them to develop a connection to nature helping them to understand the environmental and climate threats that we're facing collectively, but most importantly, helping them to develop a sense of agency and ability and confidence to actually do something about these issues. Next slide, please. So the programme goals to try and address these aims are fourfold. So one of the goals is that we're actually going to try and increase how much nature and wildlife is um, available and, and present on the educational estate. We're also beyond science and technology skills, wanting to equip young people with a broader range of green skills that will support a more sustainable future. We want to help young people be able to make good choices and feel confident to actually choose environmentally friendly uh, lifestyle choices and behaviours. And increasingly importantly, we want to help young people to build resilience and um, to look after their health and well-being. And nature connection is a really strong component of, of addressing that issue. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the Nature Park, we're designing it very much to be student led. So we're producing the resources, the activities, the tools to help you as educators and staff in educational settings support students to be the creative leads, the technical leads, the scientific leads, the ones making the decisions and the choices about what the Nature Park should look like on your educational setting site. And in time, the Nature Park will become a network of spaces across England where we know in lots of detail what types of habitats are present across the estate. We'll have thousands of different positive changes and interventions taking place and being put into practice. And we'll be recording uh, the biodiversity and nature impacts of those as community scientists collectively. And so this leads to a wide range of environmental, educational and health benefits, both for nature and for the young people themselves. And so this is for all schools, nurseries and colleges in England. So this is from two year olds all the way through to 18 year olds. And we're designing the programme very much so that it, it actually delivers the curriculum for you educators and staff members and um, across all different subject matters. So everything from English and maths and sciences through to geography, humanities, the arts, sports, we're looking for ways to, to make this a core part of everything that you need to deliver in school. 
And it really does not matter if you don't have access to green space. It doesn't matter if you don't have a lot of outdoor space at all. Even schools that have no outdoor space, but have kind of your external walls and fences and windowsills and roofs, there are still ways that you can take part and participate in the programme. Next slide, please. So we're organising the kind of the way to make changes and make interventions on your site. We're organising these into what we're calling habitat packages. So a habitat package will be a suite of intervention options that your students can choose from for a specific type of habitat that might be on your, your grounds. And alongside the interventions options, there's going to be biodiversity and nature monitoring activities to do so that you can establish what nature was there before and what nature was there after. Um, and the reason that we're starting with these grey spaces is because not every school in England has access to green space within their grounds, but we know that every setting has access to these grey spaces. Um, and so it's a really good place to start so that everyone can be included. And when we're talking about grey space, what we actually mean is we mean the human built environment, those non-natural spaces that are concrete and tarmac, brick, stone, plastic, metal, that really kind of urban built environment. And one of the really exciting um, reasons for starting here and one of the opportunities here is that this is a place where we've got the greatest potential for increasing biodiversity because in most circumstances we're starting from nothing or next to nothing in terms of what nature is already there. So even the tiniest little change like putting a planter on the playground that's got some pollinator friendly plants on can make a huge difference because particularly in urban spaces that could be an island of food for insects struggling to find access to flowers in an otherwise built environment. Next slide please. And so um, the interventions and this making change is really a core part of the community science of, of the Nature Park programme. So community science, when I say that I mean that the students at your settings, but also yourselves, will play the role. Um, when I say play, I don't mean play, I mean take a genuine role in actually collecting scientific data and information, analysing that and making interpretations of that to understand where did your site start in terms of the, the nature that was present and how did the interventions you put in place change and increase the biodiversity um, on your grounds. And so with so many settings across England taking part, we've got this huge opportunity to collaborate both you as educational settings, but us at the museum and the Royal Horticultural Society and Learning Through Landscapes too. We've got an opportunity to collaborate to really find lessons learned through scientific inquiry and bring all of this data together so that then the research scientists at the museum can work with the students' data and findings to produce research insights and papers that mean we can pass this knowledge on to the broader society outside of the educational settings. And because this is, um, because the interventions are part of the scientific process, in this first year, we've got a couple of asks um, that we need to ask of you in order to make sure that the changes you make can be recorded, the impact of those can be recorded and accounted for. So firstly, it's really important um, that your setting complete the habitat map for your educational setting first before doing any interventions. And the reason for this is twofold. Firstly, it's to make sure that um, your students have a really good, rich, detailed understanding of where what you already have on site so that any interventions they choose, they can make really good decisions about what those interventions ought to be and where they should go on the site. And secondly, so that we've got that baseline data for understanding what the starting point is so we can measure the impact of the changes that the students make. Secondly, it's really important in this first year to only create the interventions in the grey spaces that you have on your setting. You need a little bit more biodiversity 
they need a little bit more biodiversity monitoring um, so, so that we can measure the impact. And so we want to make sure that the students are really embedded in the Nature Park programme and we can help them build the scientific inquiry skills first before we get them involved in that, that more rich biodiversity monitoring. So the, we've got six different intervention options for you to pick from. And what I really want to stress here is that those options, um, they're not really prescriptive, detailed, specific things we want you to do, where we say we want you to put in a two metre by two metre pond, 30 centimetres deep with these specific plants. We're not asking for that. These interventions options are actually much broader um, themes of ideas of how you can introduce nature onto your site. Um, and they're really open and flexible so that your students can have the creativity to work out, OK, well, what do we want to create and design in our space? Um, what works best for our place and our site? And what can we do um, to enhance our site the way we want it to be? Um, and so these options um, include things like pools of water is the introduction of fresh water. And, and that could be something as simple as a small bucket pond or it could be something larger and more substantial. Waves of grasses is really about introducing um, long grasses and the wildflowers that naturally pop up amongst those. Buffets of flowers is a little bit more of a horticultural take. So we're thinking about combining lots of different types of flowers, including natives and non-natives, fruits and vegetables and any types of types of combination. Shades of trees is very much about tree planting, and this can either be in pots and containers or it could be um, where you've got the opportunity to actually dig holes in the ground and plant trees. Cascades of green walls is about making the most of the vertical spaces that you have and particularly if you're a site that doesn't have a lot of outdoor space, you can make the most of the vertical. And then catch every raindrop is about harvesting water through water butts so that you can um, use that later to look after your interventions or it's about putting rain gardens in. So these are planting systems that you can put at the bottom of your drain pipes around your building and they can slow down and manage the flow of water through your site. And what I really want to impress here um, is that what we would like to encourage students to do across the nature park is think about these things in three different ways. These are opportunities for you to um, these are opportunities for you to increase wildlife by pro producing homes and nesting sites and also uh, food opportunities, but they're also opportunities for you to improve the environmental and climatic factors on your site. So such as um, uh, trees and pools of water can have a cooling effect and trees and uh, green walls can actually trap and filter pollutants to improve air quality. But really, we also want students to be thinking about, well, how can we make our space more interesting? How can we make it more inspiring for ourselves? And what are the therapeutic impacts we might have in terms of, um, you know, the way breeze can and blow through grasses and light can reflect off water? So it's thinking about the wildlife impacts, the environmental impacts, but also how do we create uh, richer, more enjoyable spaces for the young people and your wider school community? to actually take um, spend time in and I'll pass over to Mary. Thanks Jade. Um, so what I'm going to do is, is talk about the importance of planning, management and maintenance of your ground. So if you're making changes you need to ensure that you keep those in high quality and we, we have the habitats we want. When um, you're planning changes to your, your grounds we're talking through taking you through a five stage process so we start by getting you to look at your space now. What's what have you got there? How is it used? What wildlife do you have? And all those, you know, that kind of thing to get a baseline of what you've got before we then look at what are the opportunities? What could we do to make a difference? Make work out how we do that problem solving, making decisions before we actually make those changes. And then importantly, with this project, we record those changes before we start again on maybe something new. Because this isn't a project that is just this year, the idea that this continues over the next few years and hopefully kind of for, for a long term uh, 
time. So what I'm looking at here is focusing, as I say, on management and maintenance. Management, we mean the long term looking after of your site and the maintenance is the kind of the day to day um, stuff. So it's really important to say that when you're planning change, you need to think ahead to what are we going to need to do to look after those changes? And every change you do will need some maintenance at some point. Um, so that needs to be factored in when you're you're planning for those changes. You need to think about are we going to be able to look after what the difference we've made? Who's going to look after it? How, what needs to happen, etc. And we'll talk about how you think that through through this process. Um, and gardening maintenance, it's all about interrupting succession. So what is succession? If you had a pond, for example, and you did nothing to it over the years, it will end up getting silted up and then it will dry out possibly and then it might um, grow with lots of different herbs and, and wildflowers maybe and then shrubs might grow in it and then eventually you will end up with woodland over your your what was your pond so in order to stop that from happening to have a variety of habitats on your site you're going to be looking at different torts, sorts of maintenance um, and lots of wildlife has different needs this is why we want lots of different habitats because different wildlife needs different sorts of habitats and different sources of food and that's why we need maintenance to to keep that going so let's work our way through this this process so the first is getting to know your space and its maintenance so um jade already mentioned some of the surveys we're going to be using but we're going to focus here on the maintenance so are you somebody who undertakes the maintenance of the school grounds? And if so, do you work on your own, which is often the case in primary schools? Are you part of a team? Are you contracted in or are you employed by the school? So if you're the school, what is your maintenance uh, team? What are your grounds staff? Which of those are they? Um, and who manages the contract from the school's perspective? That might be operations manager. It might be a bursar. It's unlikely to be somebody whose particular skills and knowledge is kind of looking after grounds. It's just one of the many things that they, they look up after. So the first thing to think about is who is it that's that's overseeing the maintenance and what is in your current contract? Do you know what you're currently paying for, uh, for having your grounds maintained? Um, so it's really important that we start at that. Where are we now getting to know your space, getting to know your maintenance? What are we doing at the moment? There may be elements that you're parents uh, do and your staff and pupils. So if a school's got a growing area, it's quite common that that classes look after that growing area as well. Um, and before we move on to the next slide, I'm just going to talk about this slide. And it's all about having conversations with staff and ground staff. So in this slide, this was a school that was looking for pollinators. So the slide, if you saw the image before this, this is um, in a secondary school and pupils are out doing surveys on pollinating insects. And because there's lots of um, clover in this area and it's just a, an ordinary rough space between two buildings, there was tons of wildlife, lots of pollinators out there for the survey. Next minute, we see the ground staff coming on and gang mowing all of those um, bits of clover down and then the next uh, image you would see is a flat area of grass and and pupils trying to find pollinators and failing and it's not the ground maintenance guy's fault because that would have been in the contract that every year they come in and every couple of weeks maybe they come and maintain that bit of, of ground and this is one of the things to think about is the maintenance of your grounds to do with performance is it we need to keep the grass cut to a certain level or is it about frequency we come in every two weeks and we just gang mow the other area whether they need it or not so it's really important this is why it's important to look at the contract what have you actually got in there but unless the grounds maintenance team know what you're trying to do and what you're trying to achieve uh, they don't know that you're just wanting to carry on before and the gang mower comes in and mows it all down. So have those conversations between the school and the ground staff. What are you trying to do so that they understand the aims of what you're doing? And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So next one. Thank you. Um, and there are lots of opportunities for thinking about maintenance and you can do maintenance for two reasons in, in this kind of context of trying to increase habitats on your grounds. It might be to 
to maintain an existing habitat. So if you already have a pond, for example, you need to think about how are we going to maintain that pond and making sure it's it's cleared out on a regular basis or parts of it so that it's always healthy and you've got a good healthy habitat. But it may also be that you're changing the maintenance in order to create a new habitat. So for example, you might be changing the mowing regime and so you're mowing an area much less frequently to change the sort of area that you're having and to try and increase the the biodiversity of that space and maybe creating a meadow. So some of those changes that you might want to think about might include stopping the use of pesticides. So a lot of schools use pesticides, that includes herbicides, insecticides, to control areas of, of what they think might be out of control um, plants in particular. Well, one of the things we'd like you to, to suggest is we reduce down and ideally kind of stop that use of pesticides because that is going to be harmful for the wildlife that we are wanting to encourage on the site. It can be harmful for the, the users of the site as well. So that's something to, to think about. Can we reduce or ideally stop the use of pesticides? Can we go peat free? Because we know that sourcing peat from the natural environment is bad. That peat in its natural state will capture a lot of carbon. Um, and we take it out of its natural state, that carbon capture is lost. So we want to try and use other um, composts and things like that too um, when we're thinking about planting and, and improving the soil on our site. We want to use the natural rainwater, especially things like ponds. You never want to fill up with with a hose. Much better to use the rainwater for all sorts of reasons and the chemical uh, makeup of the water. I've talked about changing re mowing regimes. You may also think about how are we going to change how we prune shrubs, hedges and trees to encourage more wildlife. So if you as the maintenance team work with the school to think about which areas can we increase biodiversity, as, as Jade said, if you're starting on the grey areas, um, you know, a lot of things that you will do will really help to increase um, that biodiversity. But you need to also look at are we um, changing something where there's already good biodiversity on the grey to green, hopefully not, but there may be on later ch um, changes that you might be changing one habitat to another. So we need to consider that. But we also need to think about how much is the maintenance and management going to cost? Has it got time and cost implications? And you need to balance that out. And it may be that some of the pupils can get involved in more of the maintenance and balance the cost that way. And again, we'll look at that in a moment. Um, but it's important, as, as Jade said, this is not just about benefits for wildlife, it's benefits for pupils. And so it also has to integrate with how you already use the site. So there's some obvious things such as you are not going to put a pond or stop mowing the grass in your uh, on your football pitches. But there are other things that might not be as, as obvious, things like access to sites, access to the wildlife um, and making sure that wildlife and people live alongside each other. Next one, please. So once you have um, identified what you could do, then you've got to kind of do the problem solving. How do we do that? What do we actually do to make those changes? And I'm suggesting that you might want to move towards creating a management plan. It doesn't have to be complicated and you can do it step by step. So you don't have to do it all at once. If you look at your grounds maintenance contract, chances are you will have a plan of your grounds um, and it will identify what different management is taking place in different areas of the site and there should be a schedule of the works uh, to do. So it's really looking at that and thinking, how are we going to change it? Uh, again, you need to liaise between the, the school and the ground staff to agree those changes. Sometimes there'll be um, a time when you review the contract every five years or something like that and changes can be made. Sometimes if you make the changes outside that time period, there may be a charge, but hopefully you'll be able to negotiate with your ground um, operator and say, look, let's just make the changes and let's not charge for that change to be made. Um, so you do need to really talk with them so they understand what you're doing and what you're trying to achieve. Um, so you want to map out the changes and you'll be doing that as part of the Nature Park project. So that is fantastic. Let's use that so that you're already getting that information, gathering that information and that can feed into your management plan. And you'll see here, I've just got a little bit of um, of a, a management plan, a section from a management plant uh, plan. And what it's got is when you need to do something, what, what's the maintenance that you need to do? Why are you doing it? And this is really important. So the grounds maintenance people understand why, and so that the pupils in the school understand why, and then who. So if we look to January to February, 
um, and we're looking here at maintaining flower beds, pots and planters, that you might have a clearance of those growing beds and then composting what you remove and, and just turning everything and, and making sure it's in good order for the next planting season. And why are you doing that? You're doing it to ensure that it remains healthy and not overgrown. And that could be pupils um, doing that often as um, a class will have responsibility for a, a raised bed or something like that. But it could be also the grounds maintenance team coming in. So just talking about who can do it, what happens if the school pupils don't get a chance to do it? How do we ensure that it maintains that quality? So it's not rocket science. It's, it can be quite simple, but work with your contractor to get that right. Next one, please. Um, the other thing that you'll be thinking about, if you're thinking of changing habitats, some of those you might be concerned that you're bringing in something a bit more risky into your grounds and that something that you maybe haven't had before and probably the one that think people worry most about is if you're thinking about um, bringing a pond into your your grounds and you're adding water. So what I'm going to do is talk about how we encourage uh, schools to do a risk benefit approach. Um, this doesn't eliminate your existing risk assessments, it just adds to it. So I'll, I'll talk about how. So the first thing to do is thinking about what are the benefits of, in this case, um, having a pond in your school grounds. Well, there's all those health benefits that that Jade was talking about before, just being around water, being around nature. So that's great. But it's also a really important learning environment, um, learning about the natural environment, learning about life cycles that are part of the curriculum and seeing them in real life, that hands on real life learning. Um, it's using different environments to teach in that becomes makes it more memorable. Um, but it's also the learning of being safe around water, teaching those that good practice around water and understanding the dangers and risks, which are different things around water and what you need to do about it. So the next stage is, OK, then we'll look at the risks. So the risks can be around a pond, drowning even in very small amounts of water. Uh, the grounds around can be wet and slippery. Uh, there are um, diseases that you can get, virus disease and things like that. So what we then need to do is, OK, we need to reduce those risks as much as we can and make sure it's safe around. So we might look at you're only allowed in that space if there's um, a teacher with you. There might be a secure area around a fence around a space. There might be making sure that pupils wash their hands. It might be lying down or kneeling down on a, on a dipping platform. So all those things you need to consider so that you're reducing down uh, the risk. I said as much as possible, but what I really mean to a level that is safe to undertake uh, that activity and that the benefits that you're getting, you feel outweigh the risks. So you also will look at, has this been done before? Have other schools had ponds? And all over the world, thousands of schools have had ponds and used them very safely. And that will feed into that final judgment you make about whether you think a pond is a good thing to have. Next slide, please. So the next bit is actually making things happen. You've planned, you know what you want to do. So let's actually make things happen. And that is about changing those contracts and managing those contracts. And that should not be down to one person. That should be uh, that, as I keep talking about, the conversation between the grounds team and whoever's maintaining and managing their contract, but also the staff and ideally pupils as well. It's everybody working together so that you um, have something that works for everybody and everybody understands it. So then update your management plans and update them every year. On this project, we hope that you will continue to make changes around your grounds. It's not just about the first year only. So every year, make sure that that uh, management plan is up to date. And the final one from me. Thank you. And then um, it's going back to the beginning, getting to know your space and its maintenance again. So as I say, it's a continual process. You're building up your management plan, that details in the management plan. You start on the grey, then what area are we going to do next year? And we need to put that into our management plan. Then you're going to increase your observe the increase in biodiversity, but you're going to also look at how are things changing in our pupils as their attitudes to wildlife changed? Is their behaviour changing? Are we teaching more outdoors? Is play improving? And then very importantly, you work out what to do next. And what I have to do next is hand over to Simon. Thanks so much, Mary. Um, yeah, following on from uh, the last two presenters, I just wanted to give a bit of on the ground um, 
uh, advice on, on, on what we've seen already from some of our, our uh, Pathfinder schools that are already going through the process, have looked with their children as to what interventions they want to do and how they're going to do that on their school grounds. So we're looking at um, a school in Salford, uh, a primary school, and what we wanted to do is, is really look at the aesthetics of the ground as well as the wildlife benefits. So uh, the first couple of pictures you can see there is the existing entranceway into school where underneath the windows there was quite a robust uh, hedge shrub bed that unfortunately uh, the roots had penetrated into the drainage pipes uh, beneath the ground and it had to be ripped up. Now, as I was visiting the school to have a walk round to look at what could possibly be done, the site manager happened to come around the corner uh, and see us looking at this area and was very quick to point out that we couldn't plant in there. Now, um, you know, this is where the schools really need to be looking at, at the impacts of what they're going to do. This actually makes a prime place for um, raised beds and, and the water, the rain gardens that we've talked about where um, just to the side of the main entranceway, there's a drain pipe that we can be using to directly feed into those rain gardens to uh, provide a sustainable water source, low maintenance in the, um, the rain garden uh, raised beds have reservoirs of water underneath the planting medium. So there's water there all the time that, that uh, continually maintain those beds. The raised beds element means that we're not going to penetrate the ground and the drains are safe for the site, site manager. And within those beds, we can look at natives or we can go for um, a real mix of plants. Um, obviously, it will have to, um, uh, it will depend on the weather conditions, whether, it, whether it's say, shaded or in full sun, but it gives us opportunity to provide a really welcoming entranceway into that school, which you know is, is a car park basically, but we can improve that so much. Uh, if we go on the next slide, please. Um, the next one, Barren Corners. Now, I, I've worked in schools, I've visited many schools, and there are so many schools that have these corners where areas of playground have been fenced off to create secluded areas. Uh, this happens to be their early years setting, uh, entrance way out from the early years into their own playground. But as you can see, it's quite a barren place. Um, it's shaded for the majority of the day, which a lot of people are frightened of in terms of introducing plants. However, we can do it. Um, we've got also a, a completely tarmac surface with a drainage channel that has to be kept, kept clear. That's that's to capture all the water on that hard standing impermeable playground and take it away effectively from the school. Um, so it limits whether we the limits our ability to put in raised beds because they might sit on top of that. So one of the options we've got here is green wall systems. Now these can be uh, very expensive bought in systems or uh, there's several examples of homemade or cheaper versions that are fabric based. Um, these are fixed to the wall via battens. It's not drilling directly or the, the planted material isn't directly against the wall, so we're not introducing damp. There is an air, air gap between the, the wall of the building and the green wall. Um, the plants in the picture on the slide are actually all shade tolerant. They would all survive in that area. It means that the uh, impact on the playing space isn't taking up too much. We, you know, we're, we're not coming out a long way, so you're retaining all that playing space. But the green walls have a huge uh, benefit to clean air quality, um, cooling effect um, in the summer for the building, and even an insulative effect in the winter. So there's lots of benefits to that. The watering system has to be thought about and there are solar pump systems that we can use uh, with a, in conjunction with a water butt that pumps the water on a trickle feed into that. So that again, the maintenance is, is looking after itself. Next slide, please. 
talking about the water um irrigation is something we're going to have to think about on school grounds outdoor taps are pretty rare uh, and tend to be uh, in some back corner somewhere that only the site manager has access to so we need to think of making water accessible to maintaining these areas there's lots and lots of different varieties out there there's slim line ones that don't take up much space there's uh, quite aesthetic ones uh, uh, aesthetically pleasing that will uh, blend into your space as well as well as the normal garden center type that, that tend to be the cheapest ones and do the job they can be secured to walls so you're not worried about um you know potential of the uh, uh, you know water is heavy uh, a large weight being pulled off the wall and the taps uh, importantly can be secured so you've not got them being left on and flooding areas uh, within that uh, slide there is a picture of uh, a, a ready-made solar pump unit that you can use um, to uh, help with irrigation of raised beds or green walls um, it's uh, I don't want to lead you down any particular path with these it'd be up to you as, uh, as a site to, to look at all the different variants that are out there but there's plenty of websites that will lead you through and give you plenty of option on these next slide please um so essentially I want to say that you know yes there's a lot of planning in this yes you do have to look at your site uh come to some real decisions on what you want to do there but they are relatively quick wins for the school just some of the pictures here um all greater green uh, as Mary said before leaving some areas of grass unmown having those conversations with your grounds maintenance teams to make sure that they are left alone um that will bring in um, new species of, of wildflowers. It will increase the um, uh, species of flowers for pollinators. It, it's uh, it's a real good way of, of starting to bring in wildlife close to the school ground. Um, pools of water can be as simple as a bucket or a sink. Um, rocks in it to allow for uh, invertebrate small mammals that not to get trapped in there so they can get out of the water planted in there and, and it's a good safe way of introducing water into your school grounds um, waves of grasses um, like i said the normal areas um, we can supplement that with uh, plug plants and things like that. Um, on bare ground in particular, uh, there's lots of wildflower meadow mixes specific to uh, soil type, whether it's shaded, whether it's in full sun, uh, all these are rel readily available. Um, Buffets, buffet, buffets of flowers um, that can be your planters, annual seed mixes. Um, the picture there shows lots of nasturtiums, which are an edible plant, very easy growing, um, and they can be changed. Uh, but we can look at more sustainable uh, perennials in there and some shrubs. Um, uh, shades of, of trees now yes we we want to encourage some tree planting but that's not going to be possible if you've got a completely tarmac um, uh, play area or some trees in what essentially holes in in tarmac but around the base of that trees tree we can introduce some uh, shade loving wildflowers so it's not just a bare ground straight up to the tree trunk we can bring in that that diversity um green walls as i said can be expensive but there are cheap uh, versions out there and there are some diy versions out there and and depending on the time you've got uh, and and access to funds there's ways around that and bringing that into your school grounds even um planting directly into the ground with um climbing plants to cover up um, unsightly uh, fences uh, the site that i was talking about Grosvenor school has got some shipping containers on the site um, right onto grass or bare earth and planting directly in the soil with some climbers over trellis can really disguise those and bring in, bring in the biodiversity and catching every raindrop rain gardens water butts again cheap interventions easily done uh, but can make a big difference to your maintenance and ongoing uh, looking after the the whole site um that's it um i appreciate you all joining this um webinar i hope it's been of some use um, please make full use of uh, the nature park website all the resources are on there 
but please, if you do have further questions, the uh, email addresses are on the web page. Please send your questions through and the team will be more than happy to answer them. Uh, but that's it for tonight. Thank you for joining and have a good evening.